Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a good day. We're going to wait a couple of minutes and then we'll begin. All right, folks, I hope you're having a good day. Um, I go by Iku and uh, I'm just opening up today. We are the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. And because we are currently based out of Minneapolis, uh, I'm gonna be sharing some um, information about our state and the place that we are located. Although many of us uh, who work with NABS live across the country. In the state of Minnesota, multiple boarding schools have been identified where many children of the 11 Minnesota tribes were forced to attend. The purpose of these boarding schools was to strip away identity, assimilate into the Christian faith, disconnect them from their communities and families, and forcibly steal land resources. The repercussions are still prevalent to this day. We would like to acknowledge that our office is located in Vide Ota Otunwe, or Many Lakes City. Um, and we would like to acknowledge that our office, uh, and that's the ancestral land of the Dakota who were forcibly removed by the federal government from this area, but who continue to make their homes and speak their language on this land. We support the revitalization efforts of the Dakota language and of all 11 Minnesota tribes well-being and sovereignty. We also acknowledge that this land became known as a home to the Anishinaabe people after their migration. And our office is located in what they call the Kabakam or at the waterfalls. And the Anishinaabe people continue to make their home and speak their language on this land. We support the revitalization efforts of the Anishinaabe language and of all 11 of the Minnesota's tribes, well-being and sovereignty. Thank you so much. Um, so just for some quick housekeeping, if you want to keep your view on speaker, that will allow you to just see um, those that are speaking. We have an ASL interpreter today, Janae. We're very thankful to have her here with us. We also want to say that right now we have a bill in Congress called the Truth and Healing Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act, and it's being heard in the House right now. And so we are asking people to submit testimony in support of the act by next Thursday, May 26th. Um, and you will find more information about that in the chat as well as on our website. We also want to share that we have three new positions open that we will be sharing more about later today and throughout the week on our social media as well as our website. We are hiring for a director of healing programs, a director of public relations, and a digital archives assistant. At the end of this program today, we will be having a raffle, and the only rule is that you remain here until the raffle time. Um, and we will be having um, Lakota made products and NABS swag. Next, I would like to introduce our deputy CEO, uh, Sam Torres. Sam, you can take it away. Thank you. Tonalte no ikniwan inin kwali tonali. Greetings, my relatives. It is a good day today. We're so glad to have you here with us. My name is Sam Torres. I am 
Mexica, Nahua, born on the unceded lands of the Keech Nation, often called Southern California. I'm the Deputy Chief Executive Officer for NABS, and I'm honored to share in this space with you today to explore self-care in a time of truth and healing. This is, of course, a timely conversation given the events that transpired just last week in Washington, D.C. We witnessed two historic achievements in this movement for truth, justice, and healing from Indian boarding schools. First, in joining Secretary Holland, Assistant Secretary Newland in the Department of the Interior for the release of the first volume of the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. NABS's partnership with the Interior Department has shown to be a profoundly effective one. 408 federal Indian boarding school institutions that received federal funding or support were identified. Not contained dis descriptively in the report, though deeply connected to the proliferation of boarding schools from the early 1800s to 1969, was the designation of 89 boarding school institutions that received no federal funding or support at all. In total, 497 institutions have been identified within the scope of the Federal Indian Boarding School Policy era. We are encouraged by the initial report and are heartened by the Secretary's commitment to continue building on it, to expand into deeper research questions, and to widen the circle by bringing more folks in to support this work, including tribal nations, tribal organizations, boarding school survivors, descendants, and their relatives. We encourage you to read the full report and to learn more, to see footage of the press conference, please visit our website at boardingschoolhealing.org slash DOI report. Our historic week continued as we were invited to provide testimony in the House Natural Resources Subcommittee for Indigenous Peoples for the first hearing of HR 5444, the Truth and Healing Commission Bill on Indian Boarding School Policies Act. NAB CEO Deborah Parker offered powerful testimony alongside boarding school survivors, NAB's first VP Jim LaBelle, Dr. Ramona Klein, and Matthew Warbonnet, as well as the Honorable Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee Tribe. Committee members appeared to be deeply moved in the hearing, eager to support the bill going forward. To learn more and to view full footage of the hearing, visit our website at boardingschoolhealing.org slash truth commission. You can also find ways in which to directly engage and support by writing uh, your testimony and, and submitting it uh, in support of HR 5444. Throughout the entirety of the week, the NABS team worked tirelessly to meet this profound moment with grace, with passion, and grounded in our traditional ways. Not to mention those that weren't there with us, but have supported this work for generations to lead us to this moment. We also recognize that as deep traumas were shared and the physical, emotional, and psychological wounds that were revealed with courageous vulnerability took place, NABS has always endeavored to hold each other gently in this time of truth, justice, and healing. We're honored to share this program with you today with the intention of honoring our spirits and the recognition that heavy feelings and emotions may be coming up as a result of these historic events. We begin today with the premiere of a video summarizing the events of last week. We will release the video for public sharing in the coming weeks, so please be on the lookout for that. Please be advised that this five minute video includes boarding school survivor testimony and may bring up strong feelings and emotions as a result. Tlasokamati miyak noik niwan, deep thanks to you, my relatives. First, that the department will launch the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. At no time in history have the records or documentation of this policy been compiled or analyzed to determine the full scope of its reaches and effects. We must uncover the truth about the loss of human life and the lasting consequences of these schools. This investigation will identify past boarding school facilities and sites, the location of known and possible burial sites located at or near school facilities, and the identities and tribal affiliations of children who were taken there. I know that this process will be long and difficult. 
I know that this process will be painful. It won't undo the heartbreak and loss that so many of us feel. But only by acknowledging the past can we work toward a future that we're all proud to embrace. I remember being afraid to sleep at night, fearful of the matron's son who walked the halls at night using a flashlight to spot me in bed. He touched me like no child should ever be touched. As a little girl, those hands were huge. We started to cry when the lights went off. We cried for our parents and our mothers. And it caught on pretty soon. The whole dorm, the whole wing of the dorm was wailing into the night uh, until the next day, we, our eyes were uh, you know, closed shut. We could barely open our eyes. And that crying occurred days in and days out and weeks in and weeks in and out and months until toward the middle of the school year, no child ever cried anymore. Uh, a friend of mine had uh, was a favorite of an administrator who took her out of her classroom almost on a daily basis so that he could sexually molest her in his uh, office. She showed me her arms, and I don't know if any, much of you who know anything about cuttings, but she had scars on both sides of her arms uh, and scars upon scars and scars. And we know that she was trying to take the pain away from remember the memory of all of those selection, sexual molestations she had. It was so bad uh, that she developed multiple personalities. Uh, she was, I, she has, uh, she died uh, five or six years ago. And uh, her stories to me is just so graphic. I knew things were bad for the boys, but I also realized that the girls uh, suffered extremely uh, harshly as well. The consequences of federal Indian boarding school policies, including the intergenerational trauma caused by forced family separation and cultural eradication, which were inflicted upon generations of children as young as four years old, are heartbreaking and undeniable. This has left lasting scars for all indigenous people. There's not a single American Indian, Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian in this country whose life hasn't been affected by these schools. Our children deserve to be found. Our children deserve to be brought home. We are here for their justice. And we will not stop advocating until the United States fully accounts for the genocide committed against Native children. The time is now. Tiguitzid, Kaichka, Bisha, Miigwech. thanking you in our languages and praying that our languages come back with, with as much love and strength as our ancestors spoke them. In these past days where we have shared tears together, but also laughter, moments of pride and accomplishment amid the grief and the sadness, a whole complex of emotions, we have always endeavored to ground ourselves in our traditional ways, our languages, songs and prayers. 
in that way, I'm honored to introduce you to my brother, Amai Tavitz, Kenrick Escalanti of the Kutsan Nation, who will offer up a song as we gather here today. Laso Kamati, Amai Tavitz. You are hot, Kamadun Vintiv, Amai Tavitz, Kutsan E. Mamulik, Kenrick Escalanti, Amerikan E. Mamulik, Nyats, Kutsan, Nyats, Havatsats, Nyats, Uradik, Shuvarik. Urav, Urav, Kanav, Kuyur, Shemak, Matcha, Harish, Mak. Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Kenrick Escalani. My ancestral name given to me by my elders is Hale. Uh, I am Quetzan. Uh, I am from the Frog Clan. And today I'm going to sing a lightning song for you. And in that lightning song, it is describing a dream. It's describing a dream of the clouds moving back and forth, back and forth. And I would like to hope that this song represents a feeling that we all feel one day when we reunite uh, with all our ancestors. Matahanya to mark, a Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deidre Whiteman, and I'm the Director of Research and Education at NAMS. Hello, my relatives. I greet you all with a good heart and handshake. My name is Deidre Whiteman again. I am the daughter of Leona Azure, who is of the Meskwaki and Ojibwe nations, and Quentin Bruce Whiteman Jr of the Spirit Lake Dakota and Hidatsa Nations. I was asked to be the moderator for this event and I'm truly honored to be here with you all. Today we have Serene Thanalk with us as our guest speaker. Serene is the Chief Behavioral Health Officer at South Dakota Urban Indian Health located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and is a licensed addiction and mental health therapist. She's an enrolled member of the Ihangtua Oyate and is also from the Sichangu Oyate. She is passionate about addressing patterns of intergenerational trauma and finding ways to help individuals, families, and communities heal from the effects of historical traumas. Her passion resides in continuing to help others heal mental health and addiction through the Lakota and Dakota Lifeways. Good afternoon, Serene. It's so good to have you here with us, Maske. We are truly honored and thankful for all the work that you do. And before we move into the presentation, I wanted to ask you a question. Can you talk more about how you became passionate about the work you do? Yeah, absolutely. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for the introduction. And um, 
just in the brief moments that I've had with the, the staff at the coalition, I'm, I'm deeply touched by the heart that you all carry, the collective heart. Um, so I think as Native people, all of us either consciously or unconsciously are aware of the pain that has been afflicted upon our ancestors, which then results in so much trauma and grief that we all experience like within our own hearts, minds, and bodies. So from a young age, I was really privileged to grow up. Uh, my parents exposed us to so many different things, including our ceremonies and life ways. And through, through our ways of life, so much of it is um, high context, which often means um, lower need to be as verbally expressive. So by that, I mean, very often we um, watch, right? We were able to watch by example and we learn from that. And so I was able to see my family go through, family and community go through many, many difficult things. And through our life ways, we're able to endure. So that gave me a passion. It gave me a passion to be able to um, work with other people in a very intimate space as a therapist and in group therapies and family therapies to really dive in to the psyche and the hearts of, of people and everything that we're going through. And so I say every single day, I love to get up and come to my job because it's truly more than just a job, it's, it's a way of life. And so it's, it's really powerful for me that I'm able to walk this path in um, kind of creating space, a safe space for other people to come into my office and um, share the difficult things that they carry. Are we moving forward now with uh, the slides? Yes, it's your presentation now. Okay, Michael, <laughs> yeah, just you. making sure. Thank you, Serene. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, so thanks for the opening question. It's a really, it's a really good segue into um, talking about this really important type topic. As we said, it's very timely. Um, it's always a good time to talk about these things, but especially when uh, we have collective triggers of things that uh, we talk about are uh, in our blood memory. You know, epigenetically, we know through science now, although our people have always known that we do carry things within our um, blood memory. So within our DNA, there are genetic markers and things that are actually imprinted within us. So things that happened before we were even born, um, we can have reactions um, and triggers and things that come up. And so the ability to be able to have this conversation uh, in, in the midst of all of these things that are happening in terms of um, our children and bringing them home and finding them and what it must bring up for survivors and descendants of survivors. And even outside of that, um, just other indigenous people and what comes up for us. So we thought it was really important to be able to talk about how do we bring healing um, amidst things that sometimes feel unbearable. And so the very first step in what we know about um, healing historical and intergenerational traumas um, and our individual traumas is how do we create safety? It's incredibly hard to move forward with any sort of healing if you yourself do not feel safe. So today we're gonna explore some topics related to intergenerational trauma, doing some defining of what individual trauma is versus collective trauma, how that's different for our Native people. Um, and then we're gonna look at some symptoms that some of us may experience, and especially those who are survivors of the boarding school and the descendants. And then we're gonna go into looking at what are some actual tools and things that we can access for what we call our internal resources. So there's external resources like therapy, um, going to ceremony, talking circles, but there's also those internal resources that sometimes when we don't have direct access to those other things that we need to be able to cultivate those things um, and really carry that um, privilege and responsibility that we have as Native people to be able to access things that maybe our ancestors couldn't or the generation before us couldn't because they were in survival mode, trying to survive some of the genocides and atrocities that they experienced. So um, we'll go to our next slide. 
and that that um, last slide, you can leave it on this slide, but that last slide was a picture of the Wakaeja, you know, our children, um, but then also my my kunshi, my grandmother. Uh, she's so beautiful, um, Grandma Germaine. And there, that beautiful painting was um, by an artist named Carolyn Landon. And she did that portrait of my grandmother because my grandmother truly embodied um, just her presence was healing and therapeutic because she had gone through all of the things that we know historical trauma has brought to our people. And she was in a generation where her first language uh, was Dakota. And she was one beautiful, strong soul. And I know that she's still, you know, still with us and guides us. So I wanted to make sure and honor her in that way. Um, so what we know about um, the boarding school experience in the boarding school era, which started back in the 1800s, was to assimilate, assimilate our people into, into uh, a colonize, continue the colonization process. And the, these pictures um, taken from National Archives are really um, the stark difference between our, our traditional ways of life and then trying to move toward the you know, assimilation of um, you know, killing the Indian, as they said, and saving the man was really a, a government um, way of talking about our people. And as we know, um, within the colonized view, we were not even considered uh, full human beings in their documentation. And so if you, if you look at this process of uh, how people often will say uh, to me in the line of work that are non-natives, why, why are so many Native people struggling? Why, why do they struggle with alcoholism and mental health issues and all of these things that they observe? And because of the, the, the oppressive um, systems that continue to exist in our education systems, we don't even learn about this. Um, they're really attempting to create a cultural amnesia where um, collectively they want to wipe, you know, wipe the truth out, ignore it. And if they don't acknowledge it, the thought is that, um, you know, there won't be any accountability or having to admit what has happened. And the power of our people now is that we are using our voices in a way that um, can't be stopped and it won't be stopped. And the way that we use our voice looks different for every person. For some people, it's our literal voice to stand up and share our stories. Um, to share maybe our grandparents' stories, um, to talk about our trauma, maybe in, in safe settings. Um, for other people, it's through writing, it's through music, it's through dream work. So there's so many things that collectively are shifting. Um, but in order for us to heal some of the things in interger intergenerational trauma, we as a people have to collectively understand um, where we came from, the power before all of all of this painful um, historical trauma happened to us that that continues to be handed down in the same ways that some of the really painful things that happened to us, um, those beautiful um, ancient things continue to be in our bloodline as well. So we can go to the next slide. So um, as I mentioned, epigenetics is uh, something that's really amazing to me when we start to look at, um, again, through a scientific lens, uh, something that we have known for a long time. The way that um, Dr. Eduardo Duran talks about it uh, is a soul wound. And this, this is a collective trauma that goes beyond just the physical and psychological being. It's the, a trauma that injures where the blood doesn't flow. So again, it's not something of the physical nature that we could measure or even see, but uh, trauma literally goes into the epigenetic, epigenetic structures that determine how future generations will interact um, with our life world. So to be able to, oh, someone just asked a question um, about being able to see the slides. I'm not sure if, Others can see those or not, but I hope so. I hope you're able to see the slides. Um, so uh, the the epigenetic structure, so the soul wound. This is a really powerful thing that, in terms of healing, as we talk about creating safety, raising awareness, 
um, we, we want to make sure that we are including our Indigenous perspective. So we know that it's incredibly hard to create any kind of change collectively or individually it, as Native people if we don't heal our spirit, if we don't in the very least acknowledge our spirit. And so this idea of a soul wound is saying that we can look at someone's mind and, and have them go to therapy or we can maybe have them um, go physically to the doctor. But if we don't look at the, the soul or the spirit and acknowledge that through ceremony, then um, we are totally missing the mark with healing and creating safety. That, that connection, the Nagi, um, that Nagi, as we were taught, uh, you go into shock when you go through trauma. And the, through the, um, some of the Lakota teachings that I've heard our, um, my parents and other generations talk about is that you know, your, your spirit, it's almost um, in clinical terms, we call it freezing. You know, there's a fight, flight, or freeze mode. And the freezing is when you, you get stuck, almost kind of frozen in time. And that's why your spirit then goes and revisits things over and over because it was such a um, major event that created not only a biological change for you, but also a spiritual change. And so being able to do things through our ceremonial ways, slowly you start to call your spirit back. And there's actual um, ways, you know, that our, our medicine people do this and our spiritual helpers do this, where they can help you to, you know, call your spirit back and um, kind of uh, instead of, as we say, remembering the trauma, it's actually remembering, right? Like bringing all those parts back to you and um, being able to heal from that place. So as we talk about the science of healing trauma, um, I will say this, we know that the science shows that we have the ability, once we become aware of some of those triggers, to be able to make environmental changes to actually heal the things that happened before we were even here. To me, that is incredibly powerful. And um, at one point in my life, when I was really experiencing different traumatic memories and things, I used to uh, feel like it was almost overwhelming and a, a burden to have to face those things. But through more of the healing, I recognize it's actually a, a responsibility and um, a privilege to be able to heal some of those things that those that came before me, they were so strong. Those that came before all of us were so strong for us to literally be alive here today, having these conversations. So in that way, I wanna honor them um, by talking about them, but then also how do we move forward? Next slide. So, um, some, some symptoms that we have here. The uh, Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, some of you may know her work. If you don't and you're really interested in historical trauma specifically, um, just, to just to kind of define those two things for people that don't know, intergenerational trauma is different than historical trauma. So as we're looking at intergenerational trauma, um, it literally just means the passing of trauma from one generation to the next, either biologically or um, behaviorally by watching um, those around us. Um, historical trauma is the cumulative emotional psychological effect of uh, historical colonization that has happened collectively to our people. So you can look at those two things and recognize that as Native people, they go hand in hand because what's happened before us, um, you know, then is intergenerationally trans transmitted down the line. So some symptoms of this historical trauma that we talk about um, through Dr. Uh, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart's work is um, she identified working with the Lakota people that um, things like survivor's guilt, depression, psychic numbing, which really is a way of, um, again, these things are all what we know about trauma. And I hope to really say this to some people who may be struggling or have struggled with trauma and have blamed themselves for some of their responses or reactivity. All of these things that happen with trauma in the brain and the body and our spirit, they're automatic. We don't choose to have 
uh, we don't choose to have those responses. It's the body's way of adapting and trying to survive. And so when I say psychic numbing, it really has to do with this automatic response of numbing. I'll often have people come into my office and they will say, I just feel nothing. I feel nothing at all. Um, I don't feel happy. I don't feel sad. I don't feel any of those things. So again, an automatic response. Sometimes there's a fixation to the trauma where it's almost becomes a part of their identity, where it's incredibly hard to um, look at the world through any other lens than fear, survival response, and reactivity. And they may fixate on their individual traumas or even traumas of their ancestors. Somatic symptoms, so things within their body, and uh, being able to being able to um, recognize that um, there might be a heaviness in their chest or um, feeling sick to their stomach often when they remember an event. And so we're gonna talk about a little bit later when we talk about some of the methods of healing that we hold so much in our bodies. And so being able to work through those things by first becoming aware of the symptoms in our bodies um, and then moving towards how do we address it. So other things like having a very low self-esteem, um, victim identity, which let me let me clarify that. So victim identity can very much be um, at one point, you and or your people may have absolutely been, and well, not may have, we know for our people, we were victims to the genocide. And so when we are in those things, very often we feel helpless. And when we feel helpless, um, we, we unknowingly sometimes expose ourselves to things that um, re-victimize us. It's not anyone's fault when they are a victim, but sometimes when we live in that, we can't see beyond the box of what we were put in through that, um, what, what's what I call internalized depression. Um, what's well, not me that says it, it's a, it's a very common thing. You can look it up. It's called internalized depression. And it's, it's really the, the act of no longer needing anyone or anything externally to um, put any sort of oppression or negativity on you because you have internalized it so deeply. And this is something that we see with a lot of people that come into therapy or that just struggle, you know, with different things that have happened to them is they have taken on the views of the oppressor um, and the abuser and it becomes their narrative. It becomes their self-talk. And so being able to recognize when we are maybe embodying that victim identity and ways that we can disentangle that and ways that we can address it um, by using positive thinking, looking at our strengths, all of those things are really important. Um, in the video, we saw someone talk about self-destructive behavior, the cutting. We know that very often that is a method of, of seeking to um, find relief from the pain and the grief. That's often something that comes with results of historical trauma. Um, suicidal ideation, hypervigilance. For those of you who don't know, hypervigilance is um, when you're very, very sensitive to any sort of outward stimuli. And so if, if you hear a door shut, you might jump. It's, it's basically a, an exaggerated startle response. Um, and we know that comes from just kind of always being prepared for the worst, always um, trying to make sure what bad things have happened before. You're just always on edge just to be prepared for it. So that's hypervigilance. And of course, um, there's many others, but the last one that I will talk about is dissociation. We know that this is a, a trauma response, a trauma symptom that again happens automatically. This is not something people choose. Um, it was a way to survive in the midst of something that was incredibly traumatizing. And so the way I talk about dissociation with people is to say at one point, your dissociating is possibly what saved your life. It's possibly what saved you emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So the fact that you experience this um, may be scary. And you know, let's address that now. But first, we almost have to honor the trauma response and the survival mechanism um, and, and look at that and then say, but how is it maybe impeding your growth now? 
how is it maybe stopping you from being fully within your own body? So dissociation is another very common um, trauma response. We can go to the next slide. So I wanted to put a quote up um, as we move into, um, we've kind of defined some about what historical trauma is, or people know this very well, um, and looking at some of the symptoms. We are also looking now at how do we, at, after acknowledging that, what do we do with that? Um, well, there's no easy answer. <laughs> we know that there's no easy answer to um, centuries worth of colonization and genocide. However, we are here now today um, uh, in this generation to be able to look at what's happened. And we know with anything traumatic that's ever happened to any one individual or group of people collectively, what is healing is two things. Being able to feel not alone. We need to feel connected and seen and held. We need to feel safe. And then the other thing is being able to make a sense of meaning out of what happened. It doesn't mean to make light of or to dismiss what has happened, um, but it, it means what do I do with this thing that is creating so much pain in my life or my ancestor's life? What do I do with this heaviness and this hurt and this grief? And being able to transform that and say, okay, first I honor that, what has happened, but does carrying all of this um, really, really serve me and my children and my community, it, it doesn't. So how do I acknowledge it and then move through it? So one of the, um, there's this, uh, he, he's a somatic therapist. His name is Peter Levine. And you can look, look his stuff up. It's really powerful as well. And the way I think of his work, when we're talking about something called somatic experiencing, Somatic experiencing is what we would say in the, um, in the medicine wheel is that physical direction. And we know that the medicine wheel holds um, different medicines in different directions. And that direction would be to look at our bodies and to look at how the things that happen to us are often stored unknowingly within our body. And so somatic experiencing is the ability to recognize that our body responds in really actually really intense ways very often to things that have happened. So in this form of therapy, um, you're able to work with someone who helps you to get it one, usually to get back into your body because so many people unknowingly dissociate. Dissociation, there's a scale and there's actually different you know, uh, screenings for this where you can look and see, am I on the scale of where I just kind of zone out sometimes or am I on the scale where I don't even feel like I'm in my own body? Um, so uh, an experienced therapist can help you with that and really trying to understand, am I even in my body to work on some of these things that may be stored? So the first step is really getting within yourself and then becoming aware of symptoms and parts where you might be storing things. So a very common one, as I mentioned earlier, is people will come in and say, I feel like there's an elephant sitting on my chest, or I feel like I can't breathe. Or every time I think about the, the event tra trauma that happened, I feel like I'm going to get sick. And so the ability to become aware of it um, will help people to be able to say, okay, what am I running from? Because Sometimes when we feel uncomfortable, whether it be physically or psychologically, we run, right? We, we try to find ways to feel better. And when we are running from it, we aren't resolving it. And so being able to say, let's slow down and let's go back to your body responses, not what your mind is doing and how it's racing and forecasting ahead or stuck in the, the past. Let's look at what's happening in your body when you remember some of those difficult things, what's happening right now. And so that some of the images um, that people pull forward are very, very powerful. Um, I often will have them kind of close their eyes after we create that safe space, right? Um, of containing them within that. And me just being a witness, that's, that's all I am in those moments. I'm a, a bit of a guide, but mostly I'm just a witness. And having them being able to access different parts of 
their body that they may be holding stress or different things. Um, they come up with colors. You know, I, I see in my stomach, I see a red tangled rope or, you know, I see um, a black, something black stuck in my throat. And so um, being able to have them work with that through art and getting it out and externalize something that's very internal that they have been unaware of, only then can we really start to work through some of those things. So um, one thing I would encourage everyone to do, um, and this is a kind of a daily practice, or if you forget to do it, just a, even writing it in a journal, remembering how is my body feeling today? What are some of my body responses when I might feel triggered? And how do I soothe? How do I soothe that response when it comes up? So very important in our healing that that physical direction, being able to recognize and um, nurture our bodies and be compassionate to them. Next slide. So um, as we're looking at um, other things that are important for us to remember in terms of healing, um, I, I always say when it comes to trauma and when we're feeling triggered or very difficult things come up within us, it's about the basics. It's about the most simple things. And so we know that the nervous system within our bodies, it responds to triggers. And so sometimes we feel our heart start to beat fast and our breathing gets shallow, or our palms get sweaty. Um, other people might go numb and shut down. Um, but one of the most basic things that we can do is to work on our breathing. And so I wanted to talk about uh, a red road approach concept um, that is based upon the sacred tree of life. So we know breath is sacred. From the moment that we come out of the womb, the very first thing that we do is uh, to welcome ourselves into this world is to, to learn how to breathe, to use our lungs. And so breath is sacred. It's the one of obviously the most important elements of, of being alive. And so um, the, the tree in our, in our ways are, inc is incredibly powerful. It's not just a metaphor, right? Like a lot of people will say that, oh, these things are symbols for your culture. And no, they're not symbols, they're living relatives. And the, the tree, if you look at it, can be a reflection of who we are as people. And so we know that we can't breathe without the tree and the tree also needs us. And so if we look at the tree, we look at the roots, we look at the trunk, and we look at the branches and things that come from, from the tree. So if we move to the next slide, um, I'm just gonna have anyone put in the chat box, uh, just to put in there, what do you see when you see the tree turned on its side? Lungs. Okay, yep. And I, I love this imagery because um, it's this is literal, um, you know, like the, the underneath the ground, right? And then we have the pathway up through the trunk out to the top. And we can literally see reflected in nature, the thing that helps us to breathe within our own bodies that helps us to breathe. And so, when we look at going back to those basics and those those original teachings of mindfulness, cultural mindfulness, and our ways, um, we didn't call it that. It was just talking about the sacredness of your breath. And and so if we go to the next slide, there's so many ways to be able to look at our breath and uh, understand when maybe our breathing might be adding on to some of the anxiety. Um, when our breathing becomes very rapid or shallow, um, we are activating our nervous system even more. And so being able to recognize when it's happening and have tools to be able to slowly calm your nervous system um, will be, can be very helpful. So again, this is only one technique. This is only one technique. There are many books and you know, websites and things dedicated to this. Um, we know that in um, ancient India, in yoga, 
I've traveled to India a few times and uh, I love to look cross-culturally at how our life ways also align with other places around the world. And one thing that I really uh, learned from there was the gift of breathing and how it can bring us very present. Number one, uh, what breathing can do is it helps you to focus by counting. It helps you to focus and pay attention to your body and bring yourself present um, from some of the racing thoughts or memories or things that might be there. Largely our anxieties and when we're triggered, what comes up for us underneath is that we feel out of control and that we feel alone. And so being able to do something in a very small way, like controlling your breathing and breathing through counting um, can help to pull yourself present. It's a skill and it's a tool like anything else that you learn, it, it takes a lot of practice, but eventually it can become second nature and it can be um, actually a part of your, your daily walk. So the, the breath work is the four, seven, eight breath method. And um, this is originated by Dr. Wheel. And he talks about the traditional way of doing this uh, is to empty the lungs of air and then you breathe in through your nose for four seconds. And you hold your breath for seven seconds and then you exhale out of your mouth for eight seconds. And then he says to repeat this four times. Now I, I practice this and also um, other forms of, again, breath work. So you have to do what, uh, this comes with a disclaimer that you have to do according to your health, what works for you. So um, for some people holding their breath for seven seconds, if they have lung issues like COPD or something could be incredibly difficult. So you have to adapt this according to intuitively what you know works well for your body. But the gist of this is being able to recognize that this simple tool um, really does help you to regulate your emotions. It regulates anxiety and really actually can slow down your mind. Something as simple as breath work. So um, I'm, I'm sure we can make these slides available to you. I'm not sure how we would do that exactly, but um, there's just different ways of visualizing. Like anything in our healing work, we have to be incredibly intentional. Um, nothing just rarely happens by accident when it comes to our healing. And so some people will say, well, how, what, how can imagery help me to heal? Well, it absolutely can because it brings you sometimes out of these um, shadow spaces or these dark memories or these things that are coming up within you. And with intentionality, we can imagine beautiful things happening for ourselves. We can imagine um, that we are worth healing, that we not only are worth healing, but our ancestors, um, where you know where they they literally exist within our blood, but also wherever they are, you know, having walked the Milky Way and and gone on to the next stages, that they also will feel that healing, and and that's incredibly powerful too. And so the intentionality of creating beautiful imagery um, for yourself, even when things may not feel um, very safe within you, can be very helpful. So. Um, I think what we'll do is move on to the, to the next slide. So a question that um, in, in some of the work that, cause like, like all native families and many other na non-native families, but especially for our native families, we all have the effects of historical and intergenerational traumas. And so my family is no exception to this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, went through most of my twenties um, living in a fight, flight, or freeze response, um, living in a lot of pain, having reactivity, and um, going through a great deal of depression and, and lots of things. So a question that I, I used to ask myself, because I've always thought about people that came before me and how that influenced my parents and how it influences me now as a mother, is I would always ask, what are we carrying for our ancestors? And in the past, it used to feel heavy. And sometimes it, it does because there were things that were unresolved that came before we were even here. Um, so it's okay to acknowledge that heaviness at times and that grief that we carry. I remember being a, a late teenager and I watched a movie about a boarding school experience. 
And I had heard my parents talk about this. I knew about boarding schools, but I watched this one young native girl's experience through this movie. I was home alone. And I remember I was crying so hard and it was almost like this grieving was moving through me, almost like wailing. <laughs> it was just coming through me. And now as a woman, I know that that went beyond my own personal experience. It was the experience of those that came before me who maybe were frozen um, and were not able to grieve. And I was carrying some of that unknowingly. And I remember my father walked through the door and he looked at me and he said, you know, what's, Michengxi, what's wrong? You know, and I said, um, I just pointed to the TV and he looked at it and he, he just knew and he came up to me and he, he held me and I cried. And uh, in those moments, I knew that the things that happened to my father and that happened to my mother as a result of these things, um, boarding schools and historical trauma, um, were very much alive within me and within him. And to be able to, able to have the conversations now and look at the things that we um, can hold space for in terms of healing and um, being able to forgive is incredibly important. So in Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart's work, she talks about a process, a process of first acknowledging um, what has happened to our people. Um, and, and sometimes the, it's so important for us to acknowledge it with each other because we know that we live within a framework in our um, uh, society, it was racist society where, um, like I said earlier, there's an attempt to create a cultural amnesia that none of it ever happened. We have to validate each other and work through lateral violence of tearing each other down and validating one another that we've all gone through this. That doesn't mean we don't hold each other accountable, hold ourselves accountable. We also have to have this general acknowledgement of what's happened. From there, very often when we accept what has happened to us in our individual journeys or before us, grieving happens. If, if trauma is frozen, the end result is grief. And if we don't work through that grieving, then we stay stuck. And so being able to grieve in our different ways through our ceremonies, I know we have wiping of the tears, we have different things that can help us to work through collectively, um, our spirits to cleanse them and to let, you know, let those loved ones go and to pray for them as they journey on. Um, and then she talks about forgiveness. Um, again, I think everyone has a different experience and idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness in this way is not, again, not holding anyone accountable or glazing over what happened. It's literally saying, how do I move forward and um, really make meaning of what's happened? And as I mentioned earlier, um, remembering, right? So like, how do we as community members remember, like we all come together or some of us come together, um, even if others aren't ready or not wanting to, um, to be able to experience one another and to create change so that we're not just talking about the issues and the problems in our communities or the things that are wrong and creating some sort of shift so that we can um, make a better future for our kids, you know, start building programs, after school programs, um, making sure that you have access to a NIPI or whatever ceremonial ways you have. And it might be two or three of you, but that's powerful. That is remembering, it's, it's coming back um, to one another in community. And uh, we know that connection to our land is very powerful. Um, going back to the basics and using our five senses, which we know in healing trauma, it, accessing those senses in mindful ways is what pulls us present. You know, aromatherapy, holding a rock, we are using our senses to be present and in our bodies instead of somewhere else or dissociating or running from it through substances or relationships or being workaholics. How do we pull ourselves present? Very often, um, going outside, 
being you know in the sun or connection to the land hearing the water those are things that activate in our blood memory um, very calming mechanisms so people take these little things for granted but they really are keep it simple keep it simple and only then when we create that sense of safety within ourselves can we help other people so one of the questions that um, I wanted to just leave out there, I know we, we, I don't think we can have voice to voice dialogue right now, but is what's one thing um, that you can change in your life to make a change individually and collectively. Sometimes it starts with just forging your own path and maybe it's creating healthy boundaries within your family or in your workplace or um, recognizing when you feel really depleted, what are some things that you need to do to slow down and take care of yourself? So when we say the word self-care, um, we really mean how do you learn to be with yourself and become intuitive and connected to what you need? Very often, we look for other people to give us what we need, which is important. We need each other. We need healthy connection. But we can't have healthy connection if we're so preoccupied with saving or fixing or tending to other people, um, we have to learn to kind of let go of those things and focus on what's happening within me. And if more of us did that, we would actually be stronger together and be able to have healthier relationships. I'm speaking from 100% experience, both professionally working with many people over the years but then also my own experience of uh, the intergenerational and historical effects, the way they manifested for me personally was to be a caregiver and a fixer. And so my whole entire identity was in helping those loved ones um, that I have were struggling with addiction and mental health issues and all of those things. So being able to recognize that, you know, that actually wasn't healthy for them and it wasn't healthy for me. Just one small example that I know many Native families struggle with. Um, and it, it is a fine balance between being that good relative and giving, but then also how are you replenishing yourself? You kind of have to hold space for those, those questions too. So um, next slide. So th this is just a reminder of the, um, the beautiful connections that we do have. Very often when we have these conversations, we have to look at the, the dark, the dark side of things, the hard things, the grief, the trauma. Um, and yet it is really empowering and gives me hope that I look and see so much healing in the communities. Um, if you're working in uh, the helping field, the lens that you look at things through is through difficulty. In our communities, we have the highest rates of all of these things. We know that. Um, but in order to move forward, we have to look at the good and we have to look at the, the gifts that we've been given. And also, as I said earlier, the things that are naturally occurring within our blood bloodline, that the, the resiliency that is just there, it's inherent within us. And I think we forget that. So our songs, our intergenerational connections, um, those are the medicines that we need, especially for our Wakanyaja, for our children. How do we create safe spaces in our homes, in our communities, for them to thrive, um, or in the least to be able to talk about the things that are difficult for them, that we know that our children of the past um, could not. So it's incredibly powerful to focus on the next generation and holding ourselves accountable to be our own healing. Next slide. So this is, um, I, I like to, um, I, most people who've heard me talk before will notice that I mentioned my brother um, who's passed away. He, before he passed, uh, he died of addiction um, and very slowly took his own life. And one day we lost him unexpectedly. And he was my best friend. We were, we did everything together from the time we were young and he's now an ancestor. And um, just knowing that he is a part of that and that even though his life was short as so many of our, our children who lost their lives for very different reasons, um, but still the effects of colonization, um, 
their lives were short, but they were not meaningless. They were powerful and they motivate us to do better for ourselves and for our next generation so that they don't have to endure the things um, that our ancestors or direct descendants went through. And my brother's life was short, shorter than all of us had wanted or hoped for, but it was no less powerful in his journey um, to bring, bring healing now. His story and losing him has only fueled my, uh, my commitment to this work and to helping others to survive and thrive through their grief and mental health issues and sometimes addiction issues to be able to feel whole again. So I want to thank you all for, for joining me as I shared a little bit about this topic and maybe some, some ways that we can come home to ourselves. And I just want to give it back to Deidre and say thank you so much for, for having me. Mopila, Serene, that was really powerful. I teared up a few times and I, I um, you know, your, your work speaks for itself and I can't imagine um, the, you know, the hardships that you've had to overcome, but people like you are, are, are much needed in our communities. And I can't stress that enough that you're a, a an embodiment of like how I, I hope to be, especially in my healing journey. <laughs> and I, I just value everything that you've said. And I know our our our, our guests have are have too. And I wanted to open it up to any questions that anyone has has. So if anyone wants to put a question in the chat, we will continue on. And yes, the video will be available to everyone. We will be posting it in um, either today or the first of next week. We'll just wait a couple more minutes or a couple more seconds, see if we have any questions. Okay, so we have one, one participant who asked, can you share your thoughts on the connection between historical trauma and intimate partner violence? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that if we go back to this concept of um, internalized oppression, there's so many um, parts to this. So the first one is we know that uh, the roles that are um, men and women and two spirit relatives, the roles that they had within the communities were um, completely taken from them. So um, not only were the roles completely shifted. Um, they didn't have those same kinship terms and all of the things that were taught to us originally. So if you have a, a generation of males and, and or females, because we know it can go both ways in terms of intimate partner violence, but that don't, that are shamed for just being who they are inherently as a native person. So they're carrying shame. They're very often carrying that abuse. Um, and all of those things are then, as we know, handed down through either biologically or behaviorally to the next generation. And so many of our men um, did not have those teachings. They didn't have those teachings of what does it mean to be a protector? What do you have to do to hold yourself accountable? Um, we also don't have the same uh, community accountability where there it was close knit and everyone was watching over each other and holding each other accountable. So we have this idea of a nuclear family, which is a very westernized approach. Um, and so that isn't there, right? So there's just so many layers. But if we look just alone at that concept of internalized oppression, um, we're looking at someone who 
is um, really kind of part of that like patriarchy of, of looking and saying, um, I'm all of these things, right? It starts out as negative self-talk. It starts out as abuse. It starts out as insecurity and inferiority and shame. And what we know is that people often overcompensate from that place when they feel inferior they want to become powerful but they don't have the tools or the cultural teachings or the support or the understanding of how to get there very often and so they jump to that i'm sure many of you are aware of the power and control wheel of the duluth model which is you look at all the brackets of that wheel and it essentially shows right like trying to control and having no respect. And, and so if you look at that process of just the inferiority, shame, all the effects of historical trauma, and then you include substance abuse in there, it, it's, it's just a recipe for so many of our men um, to not have that healing and the teachings that they need. And it, again, this we can flip it around and say for women as well, because we know that women also struggle with um, being the perpetrators of um intimate partner violence at times but that's a really super brief accelerated answer of something much more complex but um, i think a lot of it can i don't think a lot of people in society look and see how historical and intergenerational trauma has created um so much strife like for our native families i often say when i see a native couple and family together i'm like man they're like defying like every odd <laughs> being together because of those effects that each of them carry even with having a pretty healthy upbringing you're still bringing so many things and so um i just really hope that's something that we can start educating our youth about is what healthy relationships are because so many of them grow up without that and so that's something i feel really passionate about too is talking to our young men and women about what is a healthy relationship you know what is acceptable and not acceptable Opila, thank you. I agree. And we have another question. Um, have you found resistance in your community to this approach? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, th there's, yeah, there's a lot of uh, people who only want to look at what we call evidence based practices and approaches. Um, and any time that you mention things like literally people think historical trauma is fake. <laughs> people will say things like, oh, that, you know, that's not a thing, you know, and I'm like, it's a fact. And let's talk about that. Um, and, and in fact, recently I, I was subpoenaed to a trial and uh, I was just processing this with some friends recently because um, I was activated my epigenetically personally i was activated on the stand as i was advocating for a native family to get their their children back and uh, i talked about intergenerational trauma and i talked about the effects of all of those things now tied into the situation and moving forward the healing path and it was completely dismissed it was completely dismissed as even being something that was a part of the family story and so um, there's just a whole lot of education to be done um, and even more than the education needs to be us just standing up and saying this may not be known this may not be accepted this may not be wanted but but i'm going to share because it, it's my experience and it's something i know collectively and so i think the more that each of us do that without waiting for the acceptance or the invite <laughs> sometimes like we just need to do it the stronger i think um our all of our work will be in supporting each other great question thank you another one you mentioned mindfulness can you speak a little more to that sure so um mindfulness is a really uh commonly used term now. And essentially what it, it means is just paying attention on purpose, right? That's what mindfulness means is I'm gonna be intentional about being in the moment. And so um, in healing trauma, one of the only ways that we can heal that is to be present in the moment. So that goes back to um, grounding ourselves in our bodies. It goes back to reminding ourselves that we're safe when we're triggered 
uh, we may, um, I think most of us can relate to, all of us have been impacted by trauma in some fashion, some much more than others. But all of us, I think, can relate to a story that we start to create in our head about a situation that's happening without having all of the facts. And so I think being able to um, pull ourselves and use that mindfulness and paying attention on purpose can be so helpful in not assuming things and also just in regulating our own thoughts and, and our body responses. Um, because once we're activated in our brain and our body, the story begins. The story may be, I'm not enough. I'm going to fail. It may be everyone's judging me. It may be that person's lying to me and I know they are, right? It can be so many different pathways of a narrative. And if we're able to be mindful and just pay attention to our breathing, we become less reactive and more responsive in our relationships and in our life. We'll be love for that. I really appreciate that. That's some really good, good advice. Something that I do personally as well, a lot of breath work and it, it does help. Let's see, I don't think we have any more. Oh, let's see. Yes, um, Jim, we will be including uh, this in our webinar and it should be uploaded in the next couple days. Okay, let's see. So Michaela had a comment, I think. Okay. okay. Do you want me to yes. res respond to that? Oh yeah, yes. Please. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so yes, thank you for saying that. You're, you're right. I think that um, our genetics are not a uh, biologic prison by any means, right? It's it's informative and it can help bring awareness and understanding to some of our reactions and maybe things that we didn't understand before. Um, and also your comment of you are not your thoughts. Yes, it's so true. We I think that we often think that um, the things that we think are who we are, a part of our identity, but we have thoughts, thousands of thoughts that come in and out of our, our consciousness um, throughout our day, right? Just in one 24 hour period, those thoughts don't define who we are and um, they, they don't, they're not fixed. And so if we, there's different things in mindfulness where you can almost envision your thoughts kind of coming in and out or your mind being like a monkey and it will go all over and, and recognizing that um, as we practice more being with ourselves, that at first it's gonna feel like it's up and down and all over, but being able to do that and tune in more and more, we recognize that we, we are not our thoughts, we are not the things that have been done to us, and we are not the things that we have done to other people. And so I think that forgiveness part for ourselves, um, when we react out of trauma, we have to become aware of it, own it, and then say, but that doesn't define who I am. And the really difficult things that have happened to me or our people, um, it doesn't all define who we are, who I am. It's a part of our story that we need to integrate in order to heal, but it is not who we are. Well, we love for that question. We have time for one more. And I did not notice that we have a question and answer box. So I'm gonna read from that. <laughs> That's my bad. My apologies. So we have a question. It says, what's important for our boarding school survivors to see in a support network? I think the very, the very first thing is to, um, first of all, those are needed. They're just baseline foundation to have a support network. Um, and the hope is to have more of those healing circles like across the nation so that people can access that support for descendants and survivors. But I think the biggest thing is, um, as the title of this, and I mentioned earlier, is to feel like a sense of safety. Um, and we really break down what safety is. It's feeling, one, intuitively what feels right. I think a lot of times um, we ignore that, um, but we need to be able to listen to our intuition and our energy and what feels, what feels right. Secondly, um, being able to have a sense of predictability 
um, really creates a sense of, of trust. So being able to access those people that you know are, are pretty consistent in who they are, um, which is usually people who aren't, you know, who don't have substance use disorders at that time. Sometimes they can be there, but you, if you're really going through it, you need to access people that are predictable and safe and trustworthy to um, hold space and keep things confidential. And so those are some of the basic tenets. And of course, this is coming from a perspective of a therapist and so um, confidentiality, someone that you know you can trust and then that consistency um, and yeah, just knowing that they're able to, to just listen sometimes and witness can be one of the most healing things. Well, Fila. We actually have time for one more. So I just seen that um, Jim LaBelle posted a question and he said, boarding school is often generational, sometimes three to four generations. Our reactions are normalized. How do we create awareness that brings us back to our indigenousness? Good question. Mm -hmm. Generational, sometimes three to four, no, okay. I think that uh, there, I, I saw something recently where um, someone was talking about normalizing wearing, you know, your moccasins, um, normalizing um, having long hair, normalizing all of the things that are a part of who we are that I think through assimilation that we've lost. And so I think being able to um, call upon those that you know in different systems, like I'm talking, I'm thinking systemically how we can address some of this, is we have to first be proud of, you know, where we come from, who we are, advocate, but within the systems that any of us work within, we have to really normalize. Um, I think now I heard someone call it indi indig indigeneity, I think is the word, like just the very act of being indigenous and what that means. What do we bring with that? Well, sometimes it may, mean we're advocating for traditional ceremonies for our graduates. Um, we have to make those things externally visible um, for the pride that we feel inside for who we are. How do we create acts around us and create policy and different things to be able to make those things commonplace so that even if other people don't wanna make room for it, we, we're creating it and we're bringing it in, which I know can be challenging for different systems, but um, it's, it, took so long for us to get where we are in terms of the trauma and centuries of it that it's going to take a long time to walk out of that but we're in a really interesting place right now being alive as human beings for the next generations that we can start to shift hopefully some of that i agree thank you and i i apologize again i i must be missing this q a section so another question, one more question. We still have a few more minutes. <clears throat> and it's by George McCulley. And he says, I'm a boarding school attendee. And one of the things I really had a hard time with was getting my hair cut. Skip to today, my grandsons have grown their hair since they were babies. And the oldest one is 22 years old. Mm. A couple of weeks ago, he called on video chat and said, Gramps, I have to show you something. He took off his beanie and he shaved all of his hair off. First thing I felt was anger, and then my body felt my blood has been taken from my body. First time I felt the trauma. What do I do now, or how does this help me? Mm. Whew. George, thank you for sharing that. That's like such a powerful story and example of um, that activation. We talked about the blood feeling like it's leaving your body, and that's a physical response in your body to something like that. And I think that um, the eventually being able to have those intergenerational conversations, if it feels organic and it feels safe and it feels right um, to even, you know, at some point share that with him, um, you know, not in that shaming way, which I, I don't think you would, but I think sometimes youth don't, don't understand because they, have no lived experience of what our, you know, people before us have. And so those stories of this is what, this is what I felt, you know, when, when I saw that it brought back those, some of those painful things that, that happened and I wasn't expecting it. 
right? I mean, literally just sharing the experience as, as more of a connecting point can be very powerful. If, again, I don't know the dynamic with your grandson, but I think uh, even if he's not able to fully comprehend now, as we all know, when we were younger, people told us things that we didn't fully understand. And then you grow up and you're like, oh, <laughs> now I understand the depth of what you were saying. And then they carry that to the next generation, right? So sometimes their limited awareness, it's about planting seeds by sharing um, the realness of what comes up for us. Um, I'll do that with my children. Very different experience, George, than what you experienced, but I will share, I will share things about, you know, if I have tears that come down about something that happened really difficult in the community, and I'll tell the kids. It's because of these things that are happening in our society with our people of color and native people. And it comes from this, you know, the historical trauma and your grandma went through this and, you know, they'll listen. And I know that they aren't quite in a place yet where they can integrate that or something, but it's an emotional memory for them that maybe along the way, maybe they'll look back if they have kids or you know nieces and nephews and share some of those things too. And so um, in whatever way feels safe and good to you, I think that would be a very powerful medicine you know, for him to, to understand because it sounds like he, does, he, he can't and doesn't fully grasp what you went through. But thank you for sharing that. That's so like powerful for you to share that with us. And thank you all to who left comments. Uh, we do appreciate it. Um, we did feel, we felt the, the, the love and the compassion. And we are so, you know, again, honored to be able to offer these presentations. And Serene, I just wanna, again, thank you so much for allowing, you know, sharing this space and time with us. We truly appreciate it. Um, I didn't know if you have any last or closing words you wanna share with us? Sure. Yeah, just to kind of close things out, um, I want, like I said, I wanted to say thank you. And one thing I forgot to mention that I can't believe I did, so I'm glad you asked me to say this, Deidre, was um, I all, one of the last things I say to people when I leave my office or if we're doing a workshop is, you know, that mani, that water is really powerful and sacred, like our breath. And so I always tell people, if you're going through a difficult time or you felt somehow activated by anything that was shared, make sure you're drinking water. You always have water with you. My grandma would always talk about like the, the water within us, you know, the way that we talk to ourselves and it's very sacred. And so also drink, drink lots of water because it helps with your nervous system and all of that. And so water, again, simple. I'm all about simple things to remind us and ground us. And so make sure you're staying hydrated. I have to tell myself because I drink lots of these coffees every day and I'm like, why am I dehydrated? So then I have to always keep water with me. Believe it or not, it's one of the most healing things that we can do for ourselves. So, but thank all of you, Wopila, Wopila for um, being with me today, for me to be with you. Wopila. All right, so we will move into our raffle. And so I'm going to introduce you to our program and operations coordinator, Lacey Kennard. Miigwech, Deidre, and miigwech, Serene, for sharing this profound wisdom and knowledge. And I know it's going to help uh, a lot within Indian country. Um, at this time, we'll be randomly drawing three names for prizes. And we are using an online random name picker to choose the winners. The prizes include a variety of NAB swag and Lakota made items. If I call your name, please go to the chat and type that you're present. If the people's names that I call are not here, we will just draw a new name. The first name that is a winner is Sonia Frazier. And if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Sonia Frazier is the first one. The second one is Lisa Rodriguez. 
And the third name is Amy Bernier Harrison. If I called your name, please just type in the chat that you're present. Okay, Sonia, we got you. The other name was Lisa Rodriguez. Amy, awesome, we got you down. And last one is Lisa. Is Lisa present? It doesn't look like Lisa is on anymore. Okay, I'll draw another name. Rebecca Black. Rebecca, it doesn't look like she's on. Oh, she is awesome. Okay, Rebecca. All right, so we have Rebecca, Sonia, and Amy. We will be contacting you via the email address that you use to register. Okay, thank you. And I'll send it back to Deidre for closing. Awesome. Those are some really good gifts. I, I hope you guys enjoy them. All right, so I'm um, just a quick uh, mention. Uh, we do have our healing events monthly. And the next one will be scheduled in June. So please uh, watch out for us on our social media pages. On uh, we, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we also ask that you support HR 544 and S2907. These are, are currently in, uh, we're working on getting this legislation passed. And please contact your local US reps and senators. And the testimony is still open until May 26th. So please, uh, if you're able to, please submit testimony in support of these bills. And I just wanna say again, on behalf of NAMS, we are so thankful you have came to uh, share with us your time. And uh, this is my first moderation event. So <laughs> I, I, I do appreciate everyone's support and we uh, will see you again next time. Wopila.